Hi, everyone. Um, everyone's just sort of rolling in here. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment. Let me, Sarah, am I? Can you spotlight me? Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Brittany Higginbotham, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. McKeever, for hosting our last um, webinar of 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Brittany Higginbotham, and I am a communications associate for the Institute for Public Relations. Today, Dr. Brooke McKeever um, will be joining us to talk about the, excuse me, um, she'll be joining us to talk about uh, her research in the public relations role in combating misinformation in public health. She's a professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communications, which is part of the College of Information and Communications at the University of South Carolina. Um, a few housekeeping notes. We will be recording this session and it will be available for playback within 24 hours on our website and YouTube channel. Um, please, we encourage you to ask questions and share resources in the chat or Q&A box. We will uh, facilitate a Q&A at the end of the session. And then lastly, if you have any technical difficulties, you can message myself or any um, IPR staff member like Sarah Jackson, and we can um, be of assistance. But with that, we will um, kick it off to Dr. McKeever. And I'm seeing everyone in the chat call, uh, say where they're calling in from. I'm calling in from Atlanta. It's so great to see everyone um, from across the United States and um, even a few different countries we have registered here today. So anyway, with that, Dr. McKeever, it is all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm so excited to be here for the last webinar of the year. It's crazy that we are at that point in the year already. Um, so I am here today. Um, you know, first, I just want to thank the Institute for Public Relations for inviting me. And again, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I'm here today to talk about the role of public relations in combating public health information. As Brittany said, I'm a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications, which is part of the College of Information and Communications at the University of South Carolina. Um, I know that's a mouthful, but um, that's who I am. And just to give you a little bit more um, about my background and kind of my current affiliations. Um, so as I said, I'm a professor now, uh, but before I got into academia, I worked for about a decade in public relations, also marketing and fundraising. I worked for a PR agency in Chicago. We had a lot of different um, restaurant and hotel and lifestyle type of clients. The image you see um, on the slide there of the Peninsula Chicago Hotel, that was one of our clients. Um, and I loved that job, but I found out pretty quickly that what I loved the most was when our corporate clients would ask us to pair them with a nonprofit organization um, to do a CSR initiative or a fundraising event or something like that. So I decided to um, try to work specifically for a nonprofit organization, and I was lucky enough to find a job with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. I worked in their Chicago office for a couple of years, and then I opened a new office for them in Pittsburgh. Um, then I went back to UNC Chapel Hill, I uh, got my PhD in mass communication and also a certificate in interdisciplinary health communication. And that's where I really found my love of health communication in addition to PR and nonprofit organizations. Um, and I realized that a lot of what I'd been doing for St. Jude all along was health communication. So that's part of why I'm here to talk to you today. Um, and then just a couple other uh, hats I wear in addition to professor are that I'm a co-investigator with the Prevention Research Center here at USC. It's part of the Arnold School of Public Health. And then I'm also um, just recently was asked to be a senior research fellow for the Arthur W. Page Center for Integrity and Public Communication at Penn State University. So I'm working with them now. Um, and again, I'm just very happy to be here with you all today. So thank you. Uh, so why are we here? Um, well, I'm actually writing a book right now. And as part of the research for that book, I came across this article. You see kind of that old fuzzy image in the upper right of your screen there um, that was a speech or an address to the American Public Health Association about the role of public relations in public health. 
And I was sort of shocked to find this. It was from 1949. And as you can see, it's from an MD, a doctor. He was the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health at the time. And he wrote that public health objectives could be hastened by the employment of a continuing good public relations program. Um, and I was, you know, so, like I said, kind of surprised, but also happy to see the recognition of public relations. Those of us that have worked in the field, that work in communications, um, realize that it can be, you know, a force for good um, and how important communications is. Um, and I would say that, you know, the same is true today. And I think never has that been more evident than in recent years with all that we've seen uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Only, of course, now compared to 1949, we have social media and the proliferation of misinformation that we see there um, that can be a major problem, um, especially for people trying to work in public health. Um, so what are we discussing today? I kind of tried to break it down into four parts. Um, we're going to talk about misinformation in public health sort of broadly, because um, I know people have different levels of knowledge about this topic. Um, then I'm going to focus uh, more specifically on vaccine hesitancy, trust, and communication. And that's just partially because a lot of my research has been related to that. And then, of course, we've seen a lot of that in recent years with the COVID-19 vaccines. And then I tried to draw five lessons that I've learned from research and also from existing campaigns. Um, so if we have, you know, professionals in the audience or faculty in the audience, hopefully um, some of that information will be of interest to you. And then we're going to end with discussion and Q&A. And I do have, I think, uh, two moments in the presentation today where I'm going to ask you to kind of take a moment and pause and think about something. So if you don't have it near you, you might want to have a piece of paper and something to write with or even, you know, notes on your phone, uh, just something where you can kind of make a few notes uh, to hang on to as we talk here today. Um, so as you all know, you've probably seen variations of the image that you see on your slide here. Misinformation matters and it comes in different forms. It can be unintentional or it can be intentional. Um, on the left side of the screen there, you see misinformation, which is you know, usually unintentional, false information um, that has been shared. And the problem with this is that it gets shared rapidly, um, especially with social media. We've seen a lot of things go viral over the years that was false. Um, then you have disinformation, which is deliberately made up false information. You know, this is kind of the, the more evil side, I guess, of misinformation. Um, examples include propaganda, retracted papers, uh, purposely misrepresenting data. Those are all forms of disinformation. Um, and then, of course, the most harmful version we see on the far right of the screen, and that is termed malinformation. And that's information that's specifically designed to hurt someone. So this includes leaks of personal information, um, deliberately changing context, uh, harassment, hate speech. Those can all fall under um, the, the form or the title of malinformation. Um, now, when it comes to public health, mostly we see mis- and disinformation. So that's mostly what we're talking about here today. Uh, and as you know, it spreads. Um, one reason for misinformation spreading is the idea of confirmation bias, which some of you may have heard. Um, you know, as the cartoon up on the top there shows, we all have biases. And most likely when we search for information, we can find something that confirms or supports our biases or beliefs. And, you know, when, when those beliefs um, or those biases are kind of in the form of true information, that's okay. But you know, there are many forms of information, many different beliefs out there. And um, when we get our beliefs that are not necessarily correct confirmed, that can be a problem. Um, and that's also when we're more likely to share information. Um, now, um, finding confirmation of information does not necessarily make it true, but it does make it easier to share, right? Because then we have images or we have links that we can share. Um, another thing you all may or may not be familiar with is the acronym STEPS, and this is from a book called Contagious, Why Things Catch On by Jonah Berger, um, and basically he breaks down information that goes viral into these steps. Um, we have the idea of social currency, you know, we share things that make us look good. In some cases, that might be why we share something or we want to kind of affiliate with a certain organization or idea or even political party or whatever it may be. 
Um, then we have triggers, things that are top of mind for us, either because they're you know top of mind in the world right now, like COVID-19, or because they're top of mind for us um, in, as individuals. Those are going to be things that we're going to share. Uh, emotion, as we all know, things that are either emotionally involving for us or um, content that's emotionally involving, whether that be a video or an image, those are things we're gonna be more likely to share. It says on the um, slide there, we share when we care. Um, and that's very true, right? Um, public is about how we share information that you know is already public or that we want to be more public. The other P is for practical value. We share news that we think others can use. And with misinformation and especially with public health information, unfortunately, that is why some people share it. You know, they think they're sharing something that is a practical value, something that could help people or that could protect people. It's just that it's not always necessarily true. Um, and then, of course, we have stories. As you all know, stories are the things that we are likely to remember and are likely to share. Um, and this information can travel very fast via social media and other means. Um, so those are various reasons, you know, why um, we share information and unfortunately why misinformation gets shared sometimes. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, as we said, misinformation matters, especially related to public health. And um, you can see here on this slide in the early months of 2020, which as we all know is when um, COVID-19 uh, began spreading rapidly, especially here in the United States, um, the views of content on social media, unfortunately, were mostly on misinformation sites that were shared on Facebook. So you can see there the orange columns um, are all the top 10 health misinformation websites that were shared via, via Facebook. And the blue columns are, you know, the views on the top 10 official health institution sites. So, you know, if you're an organization like the CDC or the WHO, um, it was kind of hard to get your information out there when you're trying to combat um, all these misinformation sites that were shared. Um, and, you know, that was more than uh, two years ago in the early months of 2020. Um, you've all become very familiar with the image at the top of your screen there of the coronavirus. Um, thankfully, we've had good developments since then. We've had the vaccines developed and rolled out to, you know, millions and billions of people worldwide, um, including to children um, in recent months and years. Um, and then we have had, you know, even more recently, you may have heard phrases like a triple demic, um, because as we go into these winter months here, they are seeing rising cases of COVID-19 again, uh, in addition to RSV and flu. Um, so there's, you know, as these viruses spread, there's information that spreads with it, and some of it is misinformation. So we need to be particularly vigilant right now. Um, now, I wanted everybody to just take a minute here and think for a moment about a time that you saw misinformation online, particularly related to public health, uh, if you can, but it doesn't have to be that. You can think of any example. Um, why do you think it was shared? And if you want to, you know, get out the pen and paper, um, do you think it was for one of these reasons, one of the steps uh, reasons, or for some other reason? I'll just give you, you know, 30 seconds or so to write something down. We have someone in the chat saying fear tied to practical value. They thought others should know. Um, we have another, uh, not Justine says not having an alternative source of truth. I don't know, great responses. Thank you, everybody. Yes, um, fear, that's a very powerful emotion, right? That's one of the most powerful emotions. And that's been found um, over and over again in research to be one reason why people believe misinformation and why they share it. So thank you for that. Um, oh, sorry, a shocking content was another one I thought was um, another great contribution. Absolutely, like absolutely. thank you. Um, and we're going to come back um, to that toward the end of the slides here. So hang on to that in your mind. Um, 
And we'll come back to those examples in the end. Um, so our communication challenge, as I mentioned, some of my research has been on reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And this research actually started before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of my research started because of just my particular interest in this belief in the myth that there was a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. You all are probably familiar with that story by now, but you know, a lot of people believe that, um, or used to believe, but unfortunately some still believe that um, the MMR vaccine um, causes autism. And so a few years ago, some colleagues and I did a survey of mothers in the US to better understand vaccine hesitancy and communication. And we found that those who were anti-vaccine or even vaccine hesitant are the ones that were most likely to communicate about this issue, both online and in person. We wrote about this for the conversation. You can go find it after this call if you want, or I'm happy to share it with people. Um, and the model that you see on the right there is from our article that we published. It's um, you know a little too complex, um, but what I can tell you that it means is that um, you know the the element that you see there on the left, personal support, the negative sign means that people who have you know low levels of support or don't even support or believe in vaccines, they are the ones that are most likely to engage in communicative action. And there are six different forms of communication activities um, that fall into that uh, concept of communicative action. And it's things like not only seeking information, but also attending to information and sharing and forwarding information, which can be really you know kind of scary if we think about it from a public health perspective, because um, it makes sense that somebody who is, you know, hesitant about vaccines or maybe anti-vaccine would um, seek information or pay attention to it. But when they start sharing it and, you know, other people who are out there on social media or on websites um, and are seeing this information proliferating, um, one of the things we wrote about was that we were worried about a false consensus that might arise um, because the majority of people who actually do believe in vaccines and do get themselves and their kids vaccinated you know, are pretty silent about this issue. We're not necessarily out there communicating on social media um, or sharing information on our social media channels. Um, but one of the things we argue is that maybe we need to be. Um, so some other uh, information, because as we all know, vaccine hesitancy is a global problem. This was a survey done in the UK um, and they found that vaccine hesitant respondents consumed significantly less information from newspapers, television, radio, and government agencies, and more information from social media. So again, you know, we have that reliance on social media. Social media can be a great place for information, as we all know, um, but it is also where a lot of misinformation spreads. Now, unfortunately, these respondents who were vaccine hesitant and were getting a lot of their information from social media also reported lower levels of trust in information from some of the more trusted sources like newspaper, television, radio, their doctor, other healthcare professionals and government agencies. So the challenge is really, you know, getting good information out there and also getting people to trust this information. Um, now, when we talk about uh, vaccine hesitancy, I know a lot of us probably think of it as a modern problem. The WHO called it one of the top 10 public health threats in 2019 because I think they saw what was coming uh, with COVID-19 and you know they saw what had been happening with childhood vaccines and the measles outbreaks that we'd seen over the years. Um, but the truth is that these anti-vaccine arguments that we see now have been around for a really long time. And there was a great article in The Conversation, which I highly recommend. Um, if you don't read articles in The Conversation, it's a lot of um, academic research that's translated in more of a journalistic style. Um, and they basically broke it down into four categories. They said that you know anti-vaccine arguments um, can come in the form of minimizing the threat of the disease. And you can see kind of the old image there, don't be alarmed by smallpox. Um, they were minimizing the threat of smallpox once the smallpox vaccines became available. Um, and you can see the image on the right is about Texas anti-vaxxers fearing mandatory COVID-19 vaccines more than the virus itself. So minimizing the threat of the health issue. We see that a lot um, with health issues when vaccines become available. Um, claiming the vaccines cause illness are ineffective or both. We've definitely seen that with COVID-19. Again, the image on the left that you see is from, you know, an old um, paper about smallpox, um, talking about it, you know, 
not being worth it and even killing children. The image on the right is the retracted paper uh, from the Lancet, which again, you may or may not be familiar with. Um, but this was an article that was written by a British scientist, Andrew Wakefield and his colleagues. Um, and this was the original source of the myth about the MMR vaccine causing autism. Unfortunately, the article was published. There was even a uh, press conference to share this news because at the time they thought it was big news. Um, but later it was found to be false. It was retracted. Um, I believe his medical license was revoked. And um, unfortunately, though, you know, that information sticks and it's still with us today. Um, declaring vaccination part of a larger conspiracy, that's kind of the third of the four anti-vaccine arguments. You can see the image there on the left is of a man in Montreal kind of being held down by a police officer so that he could be vaccinated against smallpox. And, you know, in current times, um, we see things like a BBC article about QAnon influencers who were also spreading misinformation about COVID-19. Those conspiracy theories and types, you know, tend to go together and tend to share some of that same information, unfortunately. Um, and then using alternative authorities to legitimize arguments is the fourth of those major anti-vaccine arguments that we saw both then and now. Um, you may have heard about something called the Disinformation Dozen, which was a report produced um, and it was written about in NPR and in the New York Times. And the image on the right there um, is one of those 12 individuals that was found to be the main source, one of the main sources of misleading claims and false information about COVID-19. Now, as you can see in the, the subhead there of the article, this individual is actually an osteopathic physician in Florida, um, but he has been creating and profiting from spreading disinformation about COVID-19 during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, these are all arguments that we've seen in the past and that we see in the present. Um, and this is what we're up against, you know, when we're trying to share good and correct uh, information about public health issues. So what can we do? There is some good news. I'm not going to leave you just with the bad news. Um, you all may be familiar with the Edelman Trust Barometer. I bet a lot of people in this audience are familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it, Edelman is a communications agency that um, sort of gauges trust every year. And this is from the 2022 Trust Barometer. And, um, you know, they they basically gauge trust in different sources. And the 2022 data shows that nonprofit organizations and businesses are seen as competent. Um, they're seen as the most competent, you know, more so than media and then government agencies, unfortunately, for those two groups. Um, and so I truly believe that nonprofit organizations or NGOs and businesses can help um, with spreading good information and with combating um, some of this false information. You can also see um, the image in blue there. Um, by and large, across the world, uh, my employer or, you know, individuals, employers were seen to be trusted sources. I know that we were getting a lot of information during the pandemic from the University of South Carolina, my employer, and I trusted that information. And so if you work for one of these organizations, if you are that employer, um, you know, it is partially up to you to share some of this good information. Um, so the good news is, um, you know, we can do something about it. Unfortunately, we can't make misinformation go away, um, but we can fight information, bad information with good information, and we can just constantly kind of work to combat um, the bad information or the misinformation that's out there. Um, so a few lessons learned that I told you all I was going to share. There's five of them in total. And again, this just comes from different um, research that uh, I and also lots of other people out there have done over the years, um, but also from some campaigns um, that I'm familiar with from teaching public relations and health communication courses. Um, and the first lesson I would say that I have learned over the years is that leadership is really important when it comes to public health communication. Um, this article um, that you see featured there, the image that you see on the left is from uh, something called Understanding AIDS, which was a brochure produced by the US government. And this effort was led by the Surgeon General at the time, C. Everett Koop. Uh, and it was produced during the 1980s, the late 80s, and it was sent to every US household, which was the first time the US government had ever uh, undertaken a communications effort like this. But it was done under his leadership because he saw you know, the problems that we were having with understanding 
an issue like HIV and AIDS. There was a lot of stigma surrounding it. There was a lot of misunderstanding about how you could contract HIV AIDS. And he saw um, the, the reason for sharing this good information. So he created this brochure. He sent it um, to every U.S. household. Um, he also did an HBO special. He was very media savvy. He um, went around and spoke with lots of different groups, and he was just sort of a tireless advocate for people getting good and clear information um, about HIV and AIDS. And him um, taking that leadership actually ended up winning him an award for Communicator of the Year um, from Public Relations Quarterly. So, you know, he's not a PR practitioner himself, but he was very media savvy and he listened to um, a PR agency. He actually worked with um, Ogilvy. It was called Ogilvy and Mather at the time to design this brochure. Um, and, you know, he helped lead the way um, along with um, that public relations agency. Um, let subject matter experts lead. I think we all saw this uh, during COVID-19 when the communication was more clear was when we were hearing from people like Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, he was in the news all the time. He was like C. Everett Koop uh, with HIV and AIDS in the 1980s. He was sort of tireless in his efforts uh, communicating about COVID-19 and about the vaccines when they became available. Um, and he was recognized for his efforts. He actually received an award from the Page Center for Integrity and Public Communication at Penn State uh, in 2021. And um, the other image you see there on your screen is from the trust barometer again. And I don't know if you all can even see it. It's a little small there. Um, but scientist is the column on the far right. And those were cited as the most trusted source. And um, I think that is, you know, very uh, recent or kind of new news, partially in light of um, the pandemic and what we've seen in recent years with trusted sources like Dr. Fauci being out there. Now, of course, not everyone trusts scientists, um, but they have been um, seen as one of the most trusted sources, especially when it comes to public health information. Um, building trust. So related to leadership, we need to, as communicators and as organizations and you know, even just individuals, we need to build trust. And the campaign example that I wanted to share with you all here is called Path to a Bright Future. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a new campaign from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, and it is designed to help prevent HPV, which can lead to cervical cancer, as you may know. Um, they are all about promoting on-time HPV vaccination in kids by their 13th birthday, which of course makes sense for St. Jude because, you know, their largest audience is kids and their families, um, and they also do a lot of work related to preventing cancer. Um, so they decided that they needed to take the lead um, in this effort to help build trust among the public, among families um, related to this issue, because um, sort of like we saw with HIV and AIDS in the 1980s, there's some confusion about HPV and about the vaccines and when you should get them and why you should get them and who should get them. So they decided that, you know, as a very known, respected and trusted brand, they should help build confidence in and normalize HPV vaccination. So you can see some of the images there on the right um, that they've created and are, are putting out. They are working with more than 140 partners. So it's not just, you know, a solitary effort. Um, they have more than 140 partners and they recently received um, awards for their work from PRSA Memphis. So they are being recognized for their communication. Um, this effort is actually led by a woman named Heather Brandt. Uh, she's a former faculty member from here, from University of South Carolina. She was on faculty in the Arnold School of Public Health and she is their subject matter expert. And one of her big focuses, she told me recently uh, with this campaign was um, being inclusive, you know, really focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion and being very communication, very inclusive in their communication efforts. Um, she talked about how they want to use words like caregivers instead of parents because they realize that, you know, in some families it's the grandmother, or it's the aunt or a nanny or whoever um, who may be, you know, primarily caring for a child um, and may be involved in those vaccine communication um, decisions, vaccine decisions. Um, they've also tried to make as much of the information as possible available in multiple languages. So again, just trying to, you know, be inclusive, because the more inclusive you can be, the more people you can get on your side, you know, in trusting you about this information. Um, 
lesson three um, that I think we all are aware of, but I think it um, really applies with public health content, um, is creating compelling and shareable content. Um, and I think we've seen that time and time again related to vaccines, um, related to COVID-19 and other public health issues. Um, and one organization that comes to mind for me with this issue is called I Vaccinate. Um, it's a nonprofit organization in Michigan, and it is designed to answer questions for parents in Michigan um, and just to get information out about why people should vaccinate. And um, if you have time after this session, I would say go to their website and watch this video. You can see there where it says, see why these parents chose to vaccinate. Um, it will probably bring you to tears because it is highly emotional. But as we said um, in the beginning of this presentation, that's the kind of content that is compelling. That's the kind of content that moves people. And it's also the kind of content that we share. So, you know, just as we see misinformation and kind of bad content being shared for emotional reasons, as some people mentioned, fear or shock value, um, we want to infuse emotion into our communications because these are, you know, emotional issues and you can use positive emotions um, in some cases to share information. So, as I said, this is um, an incredibly compelling video. I recommend going and watching it. They have some great content um, and they're also there to help, you know, dispel rumors. They have a place where you can ask, ask questions and, of course, frequently ask questions and things like that. Um, and it gets people to share this content, right? Um, storytelling still matters. I know we've, you know, heard for years now that storytelling matters, but some very recent research by uh, two researchers at Boston University kind of underscores this. They conducted some online experiments and they found that narratives, stories about, you know, parents sharing kind of why they got their kids vaccinated or even sharing their, you know, very mundane experiences with vaccination. So going back to um, what I shared about how those of us who do get our kids vaccinated, you know, kind of stay silent. We don't necessarily share information. Um, they actually tested that in their experiments and they found that either of those stories, so parents sharing kind of a scary story about maybe, you know, they were anti-vaccine, their child got um, a scary health issue and then they, you know, got their child vaccinated and we're now pro-vaccine, um, both that and kind of the more mundane narrative stories about, you know, I got my child vaccinated and they're fine, you know, they've avoided the flu or, or COVID-19 so far, things like that. Those types of stories um, have an effect on us, not only in terms of making us, you know, not believe misinformation, but also in terms of increasing vaccine intentions. So, you know, logically, we know that stories affect us, but I think it's nice when research actually finds support um, for this. Uh, partnerships and word of mouth. That's another thing I wanted to emphasize as kind of a lesson learned um, that I think we've all learned over the years. The image on the left is just some of the many, the 140 plus partners that St. Jude has in their HPV vaccination campaign example that I shared with y'all. And then the example on the right is um, from some work that I've done with the Prevention Research Center, we uh, worked with something called the South Carolina Community Health Workers Association to develop a vaccine communication toolkit specifically serving African American communities. That's what we were focusing on here in South Carolina. Um, and we worked with these organizations um, to gather information through research um, and also to actually get on the ground and get out there in communities and communicate about the COVID-19 vaccine because we were trying to increase uptake um, in the past year or so. Um, so partnerships can help with research. As I mentioned, um, we conducted some research and like I said, we were specifically addressing um, black or African-American communities here in South Carolina. We found some quotes from our focus groups that were really informative in terms of, you know, just understanding why people weren't getting vaccinated. Um, somebody said something like the black community is not one hive mind that thinks alike. So there's various reasons they're not taking it, which of course makes sense, but actually hearing it um, from somebody was helpful. Um, somebody actually brought up the Tuskegee experiment, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, you know, in some cases there are very real reasons from history that we can kind of look back on as to why people don't trust authority or don't trust government or don't trust various sources. Um, and we need to understand that so we can kind of get at that root of that distrust um, and help people, you know, kind of 
trust um, the, the current groups or individuals that are communicating. And they also mentioned things like we need pastors in the community to have a discussion, open their churches, tell the story that needs to be told, um, which, you know, gives us an idea for more partners and more ways that we can get the word out there through word of mouth. So um, partnerships and word of mouth, always important, um, but particularly important with public health issues and with misinformation. And then the fifth lesson um, is just about kind of listening, answering questions with empathy and focusing on solutions. Um, you can see there that I vaccinate campaign that I mentioned from Michigan. Um, you can type in your question and get answers. And then the call to action image on the right there is from the St. Jude campaign um, for the HPV vaccination initiative that they're doing. Um, we don't always know, you know, why people um, are afraid of something or why they fear something or why they're believing misinformation. So what we need to do is ask questions, let them ask questions, listen with empathy and then help, you know, in very specific and direct ways, answer those questions, provide correct information um, and give people a call to action. Um, so just kind of more specifically related to that, we need to be empathetic, we need to provide facts about safety. And as I said, we can kind of combat emotion with emotion, we can use positive emotions, um, or in some cases, even, you know, things like sadness, um, to talk about kind of the, the flip side of kind of not getting vaccinated. Um, we want to calm fears and correct misinformation, as you all may know from lots of different research that's out there. Um, family and friends, so very you know local or close ties that people have, um, are some of the sources that have helped correct misinformation and have helped change people's minds, especially related to the COVID-19 vaccine, and of course doctors, scientists. Um, and that's helpful for all of us to know as individuals, I think. Um, and then don't underestimate the power of local groups and individuals. Uh, as we know on social media, we are most trusting of those who are kind of most proximal to us, whether that be through family ties or, you know, because they're right here in South Carolina with me or right there in Florida with you or wherever you may be. Um, so we can leverage um, those ties and those people and those organizations to help us spread correct information and to mitigate misinformation. Um, and then just a few final thoughts um, related to all of this is that, um, you know, influencers and opinion leaders can help. There was a great story on NPR not too long ago about how local and state governments are using um, and working with farmers in rural towns to get information out about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, there was a partnership between the National Rural Health Association and the National Farmers Union. Um, and they were talking about how, you know, in a lot of these, especially small towns, um, a local farmer might be kind of the most known or most respected person in town. And so they were actually reaching out to some of these farmers and, you know, asking them if they had gotten vaccinated and asked if they would be willing to be a resource in their town for other people who had questions or concerns. Um, so there are usually, you know, associations or organizations that you can uh, tap into or find for whatever type of group or influencer or opinion leader that you're looking for related to a health issue. Um, when you're working with media, you know, if you're someone who does media relations or works with media, I know I used to do that a lot when I worked for the PR agency in Chicago. Um, if you're communicating about controversial issues, which some public health issues are, like the issue of vaccination, um, you want to emphasize weight of evidence information, which is something that um, some of us have written about in health communication. And basically, this is the idea that, you know, with, with journalists or media, a lot of times they want to show uh, both sides or many sides of the story. So they might talk about how, you know, vaccines are really trusted, but then there is this anti-vaccine sentiment out there. Well, as long as they come back to you know, where the weight of evidence lies, the fact that vaccines are trusted, that, you know, they are um, safe and effective. Um, as long as they come back to that information in the end, we have found through some experimental research um, that this helps people, you know, know or believe the true information and not believe the misinformation that they may encounter afterwards. Um, and just above all, you know, I think we have to kind of meet people where they are, find out the reasons for hesitancy or inaction if we're talking about other public health issues. Um, it may not be what you think. And for some, as I said, you know, there are historical reasons or other kind of real reasons for concerns, and those can often be addressed through communication. Um, I wanted everybody to take a moment and think again about that time you saw misinformation online. 
And I'm curious, and people don't have to volunteer, but if you want to just take a moment, um, did you do or say anything about it? You know, whether on the part of your organization or just as an individual, or could you hopefully, especially this time, maybe after um, talking about uh, this information that we shared here today, could you, the next time you see information, misinformation, um, do something about it? Because I think it is incumbent upon all of us um, as you know, organizational leaders, as communication practitioners, and even just as individuals. So take a moment here. Did you say or do anything about it or could you the next time you see it? know if anybody's writing anything in the chat or if people are just writing something down. So we have some comments rolling in. Some people are saying, yes, they did say something about it. Yeah. Um, some people are saying that next time they may be inclined to do something about it. Um, one person says they did not do anything um, as they believe people will see expert corrections somewhere, but reading more about, oops, mm -hmm. but reading more about misinformation now, they will do something about it next time. They don't share it. They try to share their own experiences. These are what we're seeing. Personal experiences are key. Um, and I actually had that happen myself with, um, you know, a friend who was sort of vaccine hesitant. And I think I actually shared a research article that I had done. And um, she kind of chimed in on the conversation and said, you know, as a, a new and expecting mom, I actually do have questions about this. And we kind of went back and forth. Um, and I was sharing my own experiences with her. So not necessarily trying to persuade her, um, but you know, those personal experiences that you can share um, can be very convincing uh, for people. So with that, I just wanted to open it up for questions and also again, say thank you all for being here. I know we're getting close to the end of the year and close to the holidays. So I really appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of their day to be here. And thank you again to IPR. Yes, thank you. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, well, first question is, what can PR and communication staff do to support healthcare professionals who are under attack um, from people? What can PR and communication professionals do to support healthcare professionals who are under attack? Um, I think, I guess it depends if, if, are the healthcare professionals clients or are we just talking about in general? Um, I mean, I think, Again, I wrote in there that I think it's incumbent upon all of us, but I think just showing the general public sentiment that we're all sort of in awe of healthcare workers during this time, um, that we're thankful to them, that we believe in what they're doing, whether it's you know vaccinating people or sharing information with their patients. Um, I think, you know, enhancing that norm that, you know, we're we're reliant on healthcare workers. We're thankful for healthcare workers. You know, they've been going through a ridiculously hard time these past couple of years. And I think we all have a tremendous amount of respect for them. Um, and just kind of voicing that on social media or wherever it may be, um, and kind of making that the norm will help drown out, um, you know, some of the attacks maybe on those professionals. If you know them personally, of course, you know, providing other forms of support, emotional support, um, can be helpful as well. Did that answer the question? Yeah, um, we also have another great question in the chat. Uh, th they said, this has, been a tr this has been terrific and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about how um, people measure the impact of their efforts to combat misinformation. How do you show tact a tactic or strategy that works? Uh, how do people measure their efforts to combat misinformation? Yes. That's a great question. Um, and I am not sure. I mean, I think measuring sentiment, you know, social media sentiment, there are all kinds of um, platforms out there that will help you measure sentiment. We have a social media insights lab here at the University of South Carolina where we measure that. And I think tracking trends over time is one way that we see that. 
Um, and I think that organizations can do that through some of the um, social media platforms that are out there. Um, you can also do, um, you know, an evaluation of a campaign. For example, the campaign um, that I shared from St. Jude, Path to a Bright Future, um, as I said, it's a new campaign that they're doing and part of their efforts are related to combating misinformation and they are planning a formal evaluation, um, I think she said in April of next year. So, you know, they're going to um, measure kind of the effects, the positive effects of their campaign and also probably um, ask some questions related to misinformation that people may have believed or seen before the campaign and kind of try to track um, how their campaign helped um, mitigate um, those beliefs or maybe you know get people to believe more in the true and correct information now at the end of the campaign as a result of the campaign. So those are a couple of different ways. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, well, we have a lot of questions popping off in <laughs> the chat now. We have um, another one. Public health officials continue to use safe and effective to describe the vaccines, which some research has shown to spur distrust. What is your perspective on using safe and effective in vaccine mes messaging from a PR perspective and maintaining slash building trust? We know if you need me to repeat it. <laughs> Um, yes. So, so it's just, what is my perspective on using safe and effective? Yes. I have heard that as well. Um, I mean, they are safe and effective, <laughs> so I would continue using that. Um, I think one of the things, especially with COVID-19 vaccines is getting people to understand that they're not going to prevent people getting COVID-19 necessarily. They are designed to prevent you know, serious illness, hospitalization, and death. So I think one of the reasons why people distrust these vaccines is they say, you know, oh, my neighbor got vaccinated and they still got it. They may have, but hopefully, most likely in, in many cases, they didn't you know, have to get hospitalized or have serious uh, repercussions from COVID-19. So I think it's more nuanced than just, you know, the term safe and effective. I think that phrase can and should still be used in many cases. I think it's just more um, getting some of the more nuanced information out there about, you know, what is kind of the purpose um, behind vaccines and and how they do keep us safe, even if we are still seeing incidences of COVID-19 and flu and, you know, whatever else, um, whatever vaccine we're talking about in that particular case. Okay, thank you. Um, another great question. Have you seen any research around communicating uncertainty in these health-related circumstances? I wonder if there is useful overlap with findings in risk slash crisis about how being overly certain slash unambiguous um, with the best intentions may contribute to distrust? That is a great question. Um, and I think that's something we have to be wary of in crisis communication and in public health communication. Um, and I think that's what makes these issues particularly hard to understand for you know, the general public, for, um, for people who are just kind of you know, listening and um, you know, trying to understand the situation is that, um, you know, there is a lot of nuance involved. There is evolving information all the time. Um, we talk about that, you know, in when I talk about crisis communication in my public relations courses, we talk about how, you know, it's okay to share that we don't have all the information at this time, um, but we're working on the best available information that we have and we'll update you, you know, as more information becomes available. Um, I do think it can be harmful to you know, share absolute certainty when we're not certain, but I think we have to be certain of what we are certain of, you know, like the fact that based on a lot of evidence and data that were out there, these vaccines are safe and effective. Um, but again, I think getting people to understand the nuances and kind of sharing um, some of the nuances related to these issues is, is what's important. And it's also what's really tricky about communicating about these issues. Yes. Um, let's see. 
Does your research show differences in consuming healthcare mis misinformation by demographic or geography? Um, there is some information out there about that. Uh, we did a study on um, vaccine hesitant parents related to the COVID-19 vaccine. It's not one that was included in these slides actually, um, but one of the things we found um, was that level of level of education was one of the biggest predictors, um, which you know may or may not be surprising, um, but those who had higher levels of education um, were more likely to actually get themselves and their kids vaccinated, um, and also to um, you know believe correct information and not believe misinformation. So that's the only one I can comment on at the moment, but there is um, other research out there that gets into some of those differences. Okay, um, what is your general assessment of how PR was used in encouraging people to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Maybe like a general overview of that, those campaigns. So I think, um, I think there were a lot of organizations that did it well. I think some of the campaigns that came out of um, the White House and the Department of Human Department of Health and Human Services um, were well done. I don't know. I haven't seen um, evaluation data from any of those campaigns yet. Um, and I know that I think we all know that the CDC themselves has said that they want to reassess the way that they communicated um, during the pandemic. I think um, part of the problem. Um, is the reliance on data and not so much on storytelling. Um, and you know, I think that's just kind of the nature of public health and the nature of communicating about health issues. We have the data, so we want to share it and we want to point toward it. Um, and like we said, that can be good um, in terms of putting scientists out there or even letting scientists work kind of behind the scenes um, in helping to design campaigns or helping to inform campaigns. But I think in the end, the, the campaign examples anyway that stand out in my mind and that I think were most effective are the ones that tell stories. Um, and I, I, mean, I don't wanna name specific examples here, but you all can probably think of examples too. So I think kind of using the data uh, and the science to inform the story that you tell is the way that we should be communicating. And that's not always the way that we communicate when it comes to public health issues. Awesome. And I think we have time for one more. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the concept of weight of evidence and how that is assessed and measured? Sure. So, um, and I'm happy to share articles. There's some um, articles out there that talks about weight of evidence information. Um, and basically, it's just the idea of if you think about, you know, a newspaper article and you think about the concept of balance in journalism, um, a lot of times we'll kind of start out with um, one side of the story and then a journalist will feel they need to kind of give due time or perspective to another side of the story. Um, you can think about the example of um, vaccines. You can think about uh, climate change. Um, I've seen the example even of um, kind of, um, you know, pro-gun rights and gun control. So issues like that, that are kind of controversial and that have public health impacts. Um, in journalism, in news stories, as you all know, sometimes they share one side of the story and then they share the other side of the story and then they just kind of leave it at that. They leave it, you know, to let the reader decide. And that is good journalism um, in a lot of cases. That's what a lot of journalists and reporters are taught to do. Um, but with these types of issues, with these particularly controversial issues, where there is evidence on one side of the issue more so than on the other, uh, which is the case with vaccines, which is the case with climate change, um, it's important to kind of come back to that evidence in the end and to summarize or conclude for the reader as best you can, um, you know, that this is where the evidence lies. Yes, there are people on both sides of this issue, or yes, there may be, you know, two or many sides to this story, but kind of coming back to where the consensus lies, where the evidence lies in the end, um, is what we found anyway through some experimental research uh, to be important. 
in terms of getting people to, you know, believe the true information, to not believe the false information, and to intend to, you know, do other things like get vaccinated um, or do things related to climate change, things like that. And I'm happy to share articles after this with people if needed. Yes, thank you so much. Hope that helped. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I um, I know that you probably haven't been able to see the chat, but everyone's um, been very engaged and um, appreciative of this presentation. Thank you so much for your time um, and putting this all together for us. Um, and thank, thank you to everyone who has joined us from across many different time zones. This uh, recording will be available on our website and YouTube channel within 24 hours. We'll link different resources that have been shared. Um, and Brooke, if there's anything else that had come up that um, you wanted to like a resource, I can link that in uh, on our website as well. But um, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and uh, joins us in 2023 for everything that we have coming up, webinars, um, virtual in-person events. We also have um, our diversity in the PR classroom series that we're um, relaunching in the new year. So anyway, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Dr. McKeever. Thank you again and happy holidays, everybody.